Hi, and welcome to your, <clears throat> your quarantine lecture. So today we're going to be going over sections two, four point eight and five point one. All right, so people are connecting. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy you're trying to be with us by going over for this section. What happened? Alrighty, so let's go ahead and start. I'm gonna mute all of you. Take your snacks out, get your drink so you can learn and be happy. Okay, so today I hope to go over sections 4.8 and 5.1, and then I hope to give you a quick rundown of what you to see for your exam, which is scheduled for today or this weekend. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Wonderful. So today we'll be going over section 4.8. And just to make sure you can see my screen, right? And hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So 4.8 inverse trig functions. So I don't know if this word sounds familiar, inverse. It generally means the opposite math function, right? So some inverses you've seen is if we have f of x is x squared, then the inverse is f. And to notate inverse, we have a little exponent that looks like a negative one. It's not a negative one exponent when it's written with an f. It means inverse. So the opposite of a square would be a square root, right? So there's inverses for functions. We also have different types of inverses like multiplicative inverses and additive inverses. Each of them have different functions or different ways that they are applied. For a multiplicative inverse, it would be like five over one times one over five. Our answer is one. An additive inverse would be something like one plus a negative one, which gives a zero. But they have some, some connection where it creates a mathematical opposite, I guess you can say in layman's terms. So this is what we're gonna talk about, but we're gonna apply it to trig functions. So just to give you a sneak peek, we're going to see a lot of this notation, that negative one that looks like an exponent, but again, that's not the way it behaves. Let's begin with the section with introduction. Recall from algebra, referred to appendix 1.6, that a function is a relation in which each value, each x value corresponds to exactly one y value. In other words, for every x, there is only one y. We use a vertical line test to visually determine whether a graph is a function. Okay, so we draw a vertical line, and if it only crosses once, then we can say it's a function. Here, because it crosses twice, it is not a function. So a circle is not said to be a function. Now we have another image where it's a parabola and we draw a vertical line and it only crosses once. Well, so we can say, yes, it is a function. Also recall, refer for appendix 1.6, that a function is one to one if for every y there is only one x. We use a horizontal line test to determine whether a graph is one to one. 
informally, we said our graph gets one to one if it has no turnaround points, no maximum nor minimum. A function is one to one if it's either all increasing or all decreasing. So we said a parabola. A parabola is a function, right? We have that above. It's a function. But if we draw a horizontal line test, it fills a one-to-one -one function. So we can say but is not a one-to-one -one function. It's very special to be a one-to-one -one function. It's like before you're this, you have to be this first. So I always think of that really silly analogy. That's supposed to be a hand. Where a thumb is a finger, but not all fingers are thumbs, right? So the thumb would be the one-to-one. -one. It's a finger, that's your first classification, but it's a bit more, it's a special finger, it's a thumb. I don't know if that's helpful. But that's, that's always how I refer to a one-to-one -one function. And then we have another picture right here. Here we see it is a one-to-one -one function. So before it can be a function, it needs to be, before it's a one-to-one -one function, it needs to be a function. And yeah, it is a function because it passes the vertical line test. Okay, now is it a horizontal? Is it a one-to-one -one function? Yeah, it's a one-to-one -one function because I can draw many horizontal lines and I will only cross my line once. I will not cross it more than once. Next, third recall from appendix 8.7 that an x y plane a function f of x and its inverse f inverse of x are symmetric with each other about the line y equals x as demonstrated here. So it has this dotted line and this dotted line is y equals x and it has this symmetry. And we can use this to graph the inverse. Mainly, the idea is if you fold your paper along this way, and let's say it was some really inky marker, it would copy an image. If you were to fold your paper, it would copy an image so that you have, have it here too. I remember once when I was in a math 35, I was taking a test and I forgot how to apply inverses but I remember that the mirrored image is along the line y equals x. So I took my pencil and I made it really, really dark so it would be full of the pencil graphite. And then I folded my paper and I left the image and I just copied it over. So it, it, it does work out. Now a cool feature about this is notice these points, they switch. So notice how here we have zero comma two, here I have two comma zero. Here I have negative three comma zero, here I have zero comma negative three. Negative five, negative two, if you flip them, you get two, negative five. So we can see that in inverse and the parent function, your coordinate points switch. So they switch working from your parent to the inverse. Okay, that was algebra. Let's go ahead and apply it to trigonometry. Now we're gonna learn some tricks to inverses. It might seem weird at first, but remember, they, they undo each other, that's the process that's the relationship between a parent and an the inverse. They, they mathematically are opposite. So it's like never happened if they're being multiplied together or applied together. So recall from algebra, the essential features or attributes of an inverse function. So one is a function has an inverse, f inverse of x, if and only if f of x is one to one. And if I may add a one to one function, because it needs to be a function before I may 
be even considered to be one-to-one. -one. Two, the domain of F is the range of F inverse, and the range of F is a domain of F inverse. So what this is saying is if I have F with a domain and range, with a domain and range, for F inverse, your range will now be your domain. And your domain will now be your range. This is what we refer to as your X's and your Y's, they swap. How we saw on that line above, how these points were just being flipped. Our X's are our domain, our Y's are our range. So for inverse function, we swap these values and thus the arguments for domain and range. Three, the graphs of F and an F inverse are symmetric with each other about the line Y equals X. Four, F times F inverse or composed of F inverse of X equals X. And F inverse applied to F of X equals X. Yes, X only the variable. The only the variable X should be your result. Five, to find F inverse from F of X, follow these steps. First, you want to replace F of X with Y to introduce Y into the equation. B, interchange X's and Y's. C, solve for Y and D, replace Y with an F inverse notation. At first, trigonometric functions such as f inverse of x equals cosine of x does not fit the criteria for having an inverse because of its graph. Its graph is not one to one, right? Cosine is a wave. It is a function, but it's not a one to one function. So it's not one to one. We fix this by restricting the domain of f of x equals cosine of x so that it's one to one discussed below. So we're going to only focus on a certain image of it. So if I would take a look at it from here and erase everything else, then we can say it's one-to-one. -one. It passes a horizontal line test just in this one little part. So that's what we can do to make it one-to-one. -one. Change our domain so that it's not the whole wave function, but just a small mirror of it small little window of it. Second, trigonometric functions are not algebraic. So if we interchange x and y, there's no algebraic way to solve for y. Whereas it's easy to say that for a cubic x cubed, the inverse would be the cube root, right? Just like an x squared would be the square root of x. We can easily see how these inverses apply, but for cosine, tangent, sine, there is no such command like a square root or a division or multiplication. So for trig functions, we have no ready-made inverse. Instead, we apply the inverse symbol raised to a negative one to designate the inverse of a trig function. So if I have f of x equals cosine of x, then the inverse is cosine inverse of x. So we just apply that little inverse notation to let us know, hey, this is the inverse of cosine. That's what that's telling us. Maybe not with the hey, but if you like the hey, go for it. Same thing for all of our other trick functions. They can all be written as inverses. So f of x equals sine of x, its inverse is f inverse is equal to sine inverse of x. The inverse of tangent is tangent inverse. And we make that notation with that little negative one number above. Again, it does not have an application of an exponent. Now, I know by your exponent rules, you're like, hey, 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 
but is it a number raised to negative one, one over the number? Yes, but that's when we're using an exponent application. When you have that little negative one written to a trig function or written on a function notation, it doesn't apply that way. We know that that means inverse. So this is not how, that's not how we apply it for this one. So no, okay. Notice how the negative one is used here. It is not, it is not exponent instead of B, we use an inverse symbol. So note cosine of negative one does not equal one over cosine. In other words, the inverse of cosine is not secant. So please note that an inverse does not mean the same thing as a reciprocal. Because the reciprocal functions would be cosecant, secant, and cotangent, which is one over, right? Because sine of x, its reciprocal is one over sine, which we label that to be cosecant of an argument, but that's the reciprocal, not the inverse. What is consistent though is the composition of cosine and its inverse. So just as f applied to the f inverse of x gives us x, it's also true for your trig functions. So if you see an original one with the inverse, if they're being applied to one another, then you get as a result just the argument. In this case, our argument is just x. So we get x in return. Now the reason why I'm not saying multiplication is because we're really doing composition or inputting a value. Like, so this is like these per brackets. It's like when you say f of one, or 3x. That means we make that argument of what, right? So that's how it applies. Note, all six trig functions have an inverse. However, in this textbook, we focus only on the inverses of sine, cosine, and tangent functions. Inverse trig functions, the domain restrictions. Does f of x equal to cosine of x have an inverse? It does if the graph is either all increasing or all decreasing. So here we have a problem because it's increasing, decreasing, increasing again. So it's not all increasing or all decreasing. And even if that weren't the case, we can use our horizontal line test and see, nope, not one to one, we cross our we cross a point more than once. We know though the graph of cosine is a wave and it has many maximum minima. So it is many to one function. Note in the graph of cosine, the domain values are radians and the range values are real numbers one to negative one. If we interchange points, so as to the graph, the inverse of cosine of x, the domain and range will switch and the curve will now wave up and down the y-axis. So the inverse will give us this, right? Because we're going to swap the points. Because this point right here is the point pi over two and zero. So if we swap it, zero and pi over two would be here. Another point, say this point here, let me do a different color. This point is zero comma one. If we swap them, it's one comma zero. So it's right here. Let's do one more. This point right here, let's do pi. I have pi and negative one. For my inverse, in order to graph it, I would swap those points so that I have negative one and pi. 
negative 1 down pi, there we go. So we have graphed a function f and reversed the domain and range to graph the inverse. If we interchange the points as to graph the inverse of cosine, the domain and range switch and the curve is now a wave up and down the y-axis. Note the graph of the inverse cosine is now the range, is now the range values of the radians, and the domain values are the real numbers between one and negative one. F of x cosine does not have an inverse unless, unless, unless we restrict the domain. Unless we restrict the domain. The restriction must include all possible values of cosine from negative one to one. If possible, we want to restrict, we want the restricted domain to include x equals zero. So we have this small window now to work from. It's not all of our graph, but if we focus only on that small range for your domain, that small argument for your domain, then it would be one to one because I can go ahead and draw a horizontal line anywhere on my graph and it only crosses once. Cool. So that seems to be the loophole to get a one-to-one -one function. Just as our next argument leads. So the best domain restriction that makes cosine one-to-one -one is zero is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to pi. So our x argument is from zero to pi. So we start with zero to pi. If I go any further, left or right, I, I run the risk of failing my horizontal one test. X is contained between zero and pi, is read X is an element of the interval from zero to pi. Oh, I didn't recognize, we're throwing in some, some math shorthand. So this E, is a shorthand, and it means element of. So let's say x is within that argument. For math, there's a lot of shorthand, so we don't write a lot of English words. At the end, you're writing, a, by the end, you're drawing a proof if you're a math major. Your proofs look like, like Avatar Egyptian hieroglyphics, because <laughs> there's a lot of shorthand. But you'll get an introduction to that in this class, which is really cool. In class example one, each trig function has an inverse only if it has a restricted domain. Identify the restrictions for h of x equals sine of x and k of x equals tangent of x based on these criteria. Okay, so we have a restriction one that must include all possible points of the function and it should include x equals zero. So it wants us to draw a window so that we can have a one-to-one -one function and start with zero. Okay, so if we start with zero with sine, we're starting with zero, where should I stop so that it passes the horizontal line test? So I'm good here, I'm good here. And the moment I reach that, I fail, right? Because then I would cross here and here. So I want to stop here. And I see that I can still go further down. So our picture would go, would just be this part of our graph. Let's take a look at tangent. I want to make sure I include zero. So that's gonna be included but I don't want any points to cross more than once. So if I draw a horizontal line, I see that I cross here and here. So this might be easier. I would just want to restrict it to one branch. So this would be our only window from negative pi over two to pi over two. Okay. 
and we have our answers here. Here's a summary of domain restrictions for sine, cosine, and tangent. So make sure you, you fold in this little page of your function, you know, dog ear or something, because this is, this is gold right here. This whole part will not go away. We'll see it again in chapter six. We have a function, its domain restriction, and also written in interval notation. So for cosine, if I want to make it one to one, then this needs to be my argument. One dash one means one to one. So if I want to make sure cosine is one to one, my x's need to go from zero to pi, also an in interval notation. For sine, if I want sine to be one to one, it needs to go from negative pi to negative pi over two to pi over two. And tangent, if I want to make sure it's one to one, it needs to only be from negative pi over two to pi over two. If I go beyond that limitation, then I didn't, I didn't approach it as an inverse function. So this is what you want to have. Cosine is from zero to pi, sine is from negative pi over two to pi over two, and tangent is from negative pi over two to pi over two. Super important, make sure you have this highlighted. Let's see whether you try it one. Given the graphs of cosine, sine, and tangent for the respective restrictions, draw the graph of the inverse and inverse of each and label its axis appropriately. Okay, we'll just do one of them together. We saw cosine, so let's go ahead and do sine. Let's start off by labeling these points. So that way we can just flip them. So I have the point zero comma zero. I have the point pi over two and one, and I have the point negative pi over two and negative one. All right, let's go ahead and swap our x and y's so I can plot these points in the other graph. So my x axis will now apply as my y. So I'm gonna go from pi over two to negative pi over two. And my x axis will now be made up of my y's which is from one to negative one. One, two, negative one. All right, let's go ahead and plot these points. So I'll try to color code. So this point right here in blue, pi over two and one, we're gonna swap them so that we are at one, up pi over two. All right, this next point in red, zero, zero, if I swap zero and zero, we're still at zero, zero. And lastly, pi over two and negative pi over two. We have negative one down negative pi over two. Okay, now remember, your inverse function is symmetric along the line y equals x, right? So our new graph will look like this. That is the inverse of sine equals x, sine of x. I hear someone has their microphone on. Is there a question? No, all right, we'll go ahead and continue. Okay, so this one is gold too. It has that chart we had on the previous page, but it highlights it in a unit circle and a number line. All right, so we can see that cosine is only good from zero to pi, sine is only from pi over two to negative pi over two, and tangent same as sine, but we have open intervals. Notice how we have parentheses instead of brackets. Brackets means my answer could be pi over two, 
tangent, it means it can't be pi over 2. It can be the smallest number you can think of that's close to pi over 2, but it cannot be pi over 2. can't be pi over 2. It's just a stopping point. And the reason for that is because that pi over 2 is that we have an asymptote. So that's not a value within the tangent function. Note, even though unit circle restrictions for both setting tangent include quadrant 4, we don't just say any value in quadrant 4. For example, pi over 6, I'm sorry, 11 pi over 6 is in quadrant 4 value on the unit circle, but it's not in the restricted domain. Instead, the location of negative pi over 6, which is coterminal to 11 pi over 6. All right, the inverse cosine function. As stated earlier, the restricted domain of 0 to pi, such that cosine of cosine inverse of x equals x, and cosine inverse of cosine of x equals x. For example, it is true that cosine inverse of cosine of pi over 4 gives us pi over 4. So what's going on here is that the inverse and the original function, they're undoing each other. So what is our response? What is our our answer, it's the argument. Same thing if it's written in reverse order. If I have an, well, it's not reverse order, it's just a different argument. If I have cosine inverse of cosine, well, they're mathematical inverses, so our answer is just the argument, pi over 2 over 3. We can use this information to get us started thinking about inverse cosine values in a way demonstrated. Let's find, for example, these two inverse values. Cosine inverse of pi over of 11, cosine inverse of 1 over 2, and cosine inverse of negative square root of 2. Example 2, find both cosine inverse of 1 half and cosine inverse of negative pi over 2 by filling in each blank with an appropriate value. Okay, so it's going to help us think about how to work with inverses. So make sure you have your unit circle handy. Make sure you take it out. If you don't have one handy, if you have another electronic device available like your phone or another something else, um, you can Google unit circle so you can see these values. So, if you look at unit circle, what is cosine of pi over 3? I think it's one half. I think it's one half. Okay, so let's take a look at the unit circle, just to remember how to use it. It's gonna be in your test, so make sure you're very comfortable with your unit circle. Mm. What was the question? Cosine of pi over three? Remember, it's always cosine comma sine. So cosine of pi over 3, you get 1 half. Cool. Very good. Cosine of pi over 3, we get 1 half. one half. And here, 
we get these inverses are going to cancel each other so that we're just left with pi over 3, right? So if you take your argument, cosine inverse of 1 half, what should our answer be? That was supposed to be. Well, it's guiding you to just drop it down. So our answer is pi over 3. Isn't that so weird? So now we have this argument here. Cosine inverse of 1 half is equal to pi over 3. So we are essentially now working backwards. When you're working with inverses, you're given the answer and you want to find your corresponding radian or degree. We're being used to being asked the cosine of a degree or radian and giving some type of point on the circle. Now it's going to be backwards. We're going to be given the outcome, and in return, we give an argument. So let's do one more of this uh, type of idea. So cosine of 3 pi over 4, we get negative square root of 2 over 2. OK. Now, if we work sideways, we see that cosine inverse and the original function, well, those are done. So my answer is just 3 pi over 4. So now if we take a look at this picture. Cosine inverse of negative square root of 2 over 2, our answer will be 3 pi over 4. All right, let's move forward. Example three, use the restricted domain of cosine to find those inverse functions. Now it has it highlighted here. For cosine, we can only work from zero to pi. Everything else, not an argument because that wouldn't make it a one-to-one -one function. Therefore, an inverse would not exist. So let's go ahead and, and solve for these. So cosine of square root of 3 over 2. All right, cosine of square root of 3 over 2, we have that here, right? At pi over 6. At pi over 6, we have the coordinate point square root of 3 over 2 and 1 half. And cosine is the x. So cosine inverse of square root of 3 over 2, our answer would be pi over 6. Okay, now in a unit circle within 0 to pi only, only between 0 and pi, I want to see where it's equal to negative square root of 3 over 2. So take a look at unit circle, and we get negative square root of 3 over 2 right here, right? And it has, it has a setup for you. We have the coordinate point negative square root of 3 over 2 and 1 half. Remember, um, the y is the sine. This one's the cosine. So cosine of negative square root of 3 over 2, we get this radian measure of 5 pi over 6. OK, here it has it explained. Use the restricted values of the unit circle as a guide. Cosine of square root of 3 over 2 at 30 degrees and negative square root of 3 over 2 is at 150 degrees. Okay, go ahead and take the time to try this. You try it too. I'll give you two minutes.
All right, let's see what we did. So remember, cosine can only have an argument from zero to pi. All right, cosine of one half. We have cosine of a half right here at pi over three with the coordinate point of one half and square root of three over two. So because we're working with one half, cosine of one half, cosine inverse of one half, we get pi over three. All right, cosine inverse of negative square root of two over two. We have negative square root of two over two right here in three pi over four with the coordinate point negative square root of two and negative square root of two over two. Remember, the x is the cosine. So we get three pi over four. Cosine of zero, cosine is only zero at zero with the coordinate point. Ooh, I'm wrong. Cosine is only zero right here at 90 at pi over two with the coordinate point zero comma one. So I get pi over two. At negative one, cosine is only negative one right here with the coordinate point of negative one comma zero, and this is pi. Any questions here? All right, so this is pretty much your section. We're gonna go through the same process for sine and cosine. I'm sorry, sine and tangent, but sine and tangent have different arguments. So they go from negative pi over two to pi over two. Evaluating sine inverse and tangent inverse. The technique presented for evaluating the inverse cosine values is the same for both sine and tangent inverse. However, the restricted interval from these is negative pi over two to pi over two. Note the domain restrictions for tangent inverse does not include either negative pi over two or pi over two. So those are just stopping points for a tangent. You cannot get an answer to be pi over two or negative pi over two, that's undefined. However, this is not a concern for evaluating tangent inverse because Tangent of pi over two is undefined and we don't consider evaluating tangent inverse of undefined. Example three, use the restricted domain of sine and tangent to find those values. So if it's helpful, maybe you can put your unit circle in, um, in a shape protector. And you can always highlight as you're working with it. So for sine and tangent, we have pi over two to negative pi over two. All right, sine of square root two over two. Sine is a y, and sine is square root two over two right here at pi over four, where the coordinate point of square root two over two and square root two over two. Sine is a y. So you get an answer of pi over four. Tangent of negative square root of three. All right, well, tangent is square root of three at 60 degrees, which is pi over six, which is pi over six, and therefore it would be, no, tangent is square root of three at 60, which is pi over three. So you will have this point here, negative pi over three. So tangent of inverse of negative square root of three would be negative pi over three. All right, moving forward, arc values. So we can write inverses we can write the same argument using a different uh, wording, and this is arc values. Inverse trig functions are also called arc values. For example, tangent inverse of one can also be written as arc tangent of one. Sine inverse of one, sine inverse of one half can also be written as arc sine one half. 
Essentially, when we're asked to find an example of arc cosine squared over 2 over 2, we're asking what is the unit circle arc where cosine is squared over 2 over 2? The arc value is pi over 4. So, in other words, we can take cosine inverse of square root of 2 over 2 is equal to pi over 4. And we can write the same argument. And instead of writing cosine inverse, we can write arc cosine. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. You try it for. Let's do it together. So arc cosine of 1. All right, cosine is only from 0 to pi. And cosine is 1 here with the coordinate point 1 comma 0. So our answer is 0. OK, let's do the next one. Let's do sine. Now, sine is only accepted with the argument from pi over 2 to negative pi over 2. All right. When is sine negative 1? Sine is negative 1 down here with the coordinate point of 0, comma, negative 1. Remember, sine is a y. So that would be negative pi over 2. Arc tangent of negative square root of 3. All right, well, tangent is square root of 3 at 60. So then it would also be at negative 60, which is square, negative square root of 3. I'm sorry, negative pi over 3. Again, if the arc cotangent wording throws you off, you can always write it with a little inverse notation if you prefer that. Okay, that is section 4.8. Let's continue with 5.1, proofs. Five point one providing trig identities. To begin, let's recall some pieces of our past section 4.6. I'm sorry, 2.6. So these are your reciprocal identities. So we know that secant of theta is 1 over cosine, cosecant is 1 over sine, cotangent is 1 over tangent, and also uh, cosine of theta is 1 over secant, sine of theta is 1 over cosecant, tangent of theta is 1 over cotangent. And if we ever have to multiply these because they're reciprocals, they result in 1. They're multiplicative inverses. We also know tangent is sine over cosine, cotangent is cosine over sine. Now, I skipped these from 2.6, but you can just take them for granted. Now, the way they occur is, so how do you derive these? How do these happen? Well, recall that sine is y over r, cosine is x over r, and tangent is y over x. So take your Pythagorean identity. I'm sorry, Pythagorean formula, which is um, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. We can also write it as x squared plus y squared equals r squared from our circle. And if we want to say get x by itself, if I want to get x by itself, I can go ahead and divide by x. Divide everything by an x squared. If I do x squared over x squared, that's 1. Plus, OK, well, what is y over x? y over x, that's just tangent. So I can write that as tangent squared of an argument is equal to, well, what is r over x? OK, if cosine is x over r, 
then if we flip it, that would just be secant. So we would have secant squared theta. And that's this formula that we have here. One plus tangent squared gives, is equal to secant squared. So each one of these basic formulas, which are the main formulas, like it shouldn't say basic, the main formulas are these three. And they happen from saying, hey, what happens if I make it one? I showed you what happens if I let x be one, but what if we do the same process and let make y be one? What if we do the same process and let r be one? That would give us those three formulas. Now, for the sake of doing the algebra for us, your author also made a point to write it equaling to different things. Instead of it being equal to one, here it's equal to x squared, here it's equal to sine squared. Instead of being equal to one, I have it equal to tangent, and I can do the same thing for secant. It is equal to secant squared theta. If I Oh, it's already equal to secant squared, so that works. And here, I have it equal to cosecant squared. Here, I have it equal to cotangent. But it's the same formula. I just moved my terms around. But you can highlight these as your parent Pythagorean identities. An identity is an equation that is true all possible argument values. For example, a Pythagorean identity cosine squared plus sine squared equals one is true for values theta. Here are a, few, are a few examples. So we see, for example, one, that if I plug in a pi over six, my answer will be the same, will, be, will give us one. Doesn't matter what I plug in, and it shows you the work, you always get one. So that's what's wonderful about an identity, is that it will always work no matter what. In this section, we use identities presented in section 2.6 in two different tasks. One, to simplify trig expressions, and two, to prove a spot, suppose, suppose identity really is an identity. Simplifying trig expressions. To simplify an expression is typically to write it with few operations as possible. Operations. So that means without pluses, minuses, multiplication, or division. If I can get rid of any of that, that would be ideal. That means to simplify an expression. Example one, write each expression in terms of sine and cosine and simplify. So here we have this first example A. Okay, as you're working through this section and doing your homework for this section, it might be helpful to have this page handy. So the first page 271, because we're going to be working with all these rules together. Okay, I want to simplify. Now, even though it's not written, we know a multiplication is implied, right? Procedure, use the reciprocal and ratio identities to first write express the expression in terms of only sine and cosine, then simplify if possible. That is the biggest key to this chapter. Whenever possible, write it, write it in terms of sine and cosine. So here I have secant times cotangent, for example, A. So secant is one over cosine, and cotangent is cosine over sine. Okay, if I, if I work this out, I see that cosine and cosine divide to make one, so I'm left with one over sine. Now I want to write it without division, so I can make this equal to cosecant, like we have here. And this would be simplifying our identity. Let's take a, take a look at example B. We have tangent theta plus secant theta times sine theta. Okay, so even though it's not written, we know that's being multiplied. 
So let's take a look at our procedure. Our first rule is always to write it in terms of sine and cosine. Okay, so tangent theta plus secant theta times sine theta. Let's rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. Tangent is sine over cosine. Secant is one over cosine. And sine, well, sine is just sine. Uh, if I multiply them together, I just write them one over each other. So I have sine over cosine, like we have here. Sine over cosine. Now, what needs to be true? to add a fraction. So say like 1 half plus 1 half. Our denominators need to be the same, right? In that case, I can add my numerators. Well, same thing here. You see how your denominator is the same? I can go ahead and continue to add my numerators. That one, that sine theta plus sine theta. So that I'm left here, sine theta sine theta plus sine theta over cosine theta. That gives us two sine theta over cosine theta. So what does, what does sine theta over cosine theta give us? That's just tangent. So my final answer is we bring down the two, two tangent theta. And it can't be simplified any further. We got rid of all the addition, all the multiplication, that was involved for this problem. So go ahead and give these two a try. You try it one. Write each expression in terms, in terms of sine, theta, and or cosine theta and simplify. Or in other words, just simplify. But go ahead and write in terms of sine and cosine first. Okay, let's go ahead and get started and see how you did. Now, for the remainder of this chapter five, it's really different, it's completely new. So my best advice is two things. First one is just get started. Just make a point to start writing, start working through it. And it might not be correct or perfect the first time, 
at least you, you have some rough draft, some idea of where you went wrong and what to do next. Second, if you're able to write everything in terms of sine and cosine, it makes things a bit easier to move through it or at least get started. All right, so for A, they're all being multiplied. Now my instruction is saying to write everything in terms of sine and cosine. So secant is one over cosine. Tangent is sine over cosine. And sine, well, sine is sine. But if you want to write as a fraction, you can write it as over one. Okay, now I can multiply across. I'm left with sine theta times sine theta. And cosine theta times cosine theta. Cool. All right, well, what's sine times sine? If you're ever confused, you can think of variables. X times X gives us X squared, right? So we're left with sine squared theta over cosine squared theta. And sine over cosine is tangent. So we're left with tangent squared theta as our answer. All right, for B, we have cosecant theta minus cotangent theta. All right, cosecant is one over sine minus cotangent, while tangent is sine over cosine. So therefore, cotangent is a flip of that. So cosine over sine, right? Minus, I really want that name, minus cosine theta over sine theta. All right, wonderful. They have the denominator of sine, so I'm left with one minus cosine theta over sine theta. They're being subtracted. So remember your rules for subtraction. If we ever lost, you can always do an example. Like one over three plus one over three. My three stays and I add my numerators, right? Okay, so one minus cosine over sine theta. I want to simplify. I don't want that minus or that division. So what can I do? Okay, you're gonna have to do a new, a new way of doing this. Introduce a new way. One thing we can do is if we take a look at our first page. And we see, do we have anything with subtraction? I do, right? I have one minus cosine squared, but I need to have a cosine squared. Hmm, what can I do to make that a cosine squared? Right, so it'll be right on the side. We want to have one minus cosine squared, and that gives us sine squared. That'd be cool. That would give us what we wanted. So a trick to this would be to multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate. So I multiply by one plus cosine theta, one plus cosine theta. I don't think that's gonna help. You pick to the answer. You try it once. You try it one B. Oh, that's all they want. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's all they want. That's our answer for B. In example B, we added two fractions with the same denominator. If the fractions have different denominators, then we must first try the least common denominator LCD and build up each fraction appropriately. Example two, find each fraction to have a common denominator and simplify. 
Identify the LCD and multiply by a form of one to locate the LCD of each fraction. So what it's trying to get you to is think of examples where you don't have the same denominator. So one over three plus one over two. What do you do to get the same denominator? Don't you multiply to get some common denominator? So you multiply here by a two over two. You multiply here by a three over three. And that way you can get a denominator of six. So you have two over six and three over six. Same thing here. We want to make sure we multiply by the same thing on the top and bottom. So that's a procedure. Identify the LCD and multiply a form of one to create an LCD in each fraction. So we're being asked to simplify one minus one over sine theta minus one over cosine theta. So we need to multiply a cosine theta to our first term, top and bottom, and multiply a sine theta to our second term, top and bottom. That way we can get a common denominator of sine theta times cosine theta. And therefore I can subtract my numerators, cosine theta minus sine theta. And now we have this common denominator of sine theta times cosine theta. Note, we cannot divide out, cancel either sine theta or cosine theta because there is subtraction in the, in the numerator. We can only divide out when there are common factors. Example three, in each expression, build up the fractions to have a common denominator. So for the first one, I can think of this as over one. What would be our LCD? Our lowest common denominator would be cosine theta. So I would have to only multiply this by a cosine theta top and bottom to get a common denominator. For B, What would be our LCD? Our LCD would be made up of sine squared times cosine squared times, not my times. So therefore, I would have to take the sine squared and multiply it by a cosine squared theta, top and bottom. Now I'll take that second term, cosine squared, and multiply it by a sine squared theta. All right, so let's take example A and take it a bit forward. So we multiply it by that cosine squared theta like we have above. And we multiply across cosine times cosine gives us cosine squared and the denominator have a cosine. All right, now because I have that same denominator, I can go ahead and subtract my numerator. So one minus cosine squared. One minus cosine squared according to our Pythagorean identity, we can rewrite it to equal sine. We replace it with a sine squared. For B, we made up or concluded this is what we need to multiply to each term so that we can have that same denominator of sine squared times cosine squared. And I can add my numerator. So you have sine, cosine squared plus sine squared. And we have cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one according to our Pythagorean identity. So then we just have one in the numerator. This Pythagorean identity that we learned, that we see now from section 2.6, is going to be very helpful. So be familiar with all of these. If that's too much on your paper, you can erase that. All right, let's move forward. So let's go ahead and do this, you try it too. In each expression, build up the fractions to have a common denominator. Simplify, and it gives you a hint. In each expression, B, the second fraction has a denominator of one. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at E. So I'm being asked to add two fractions. To add two fractions, 
I need to have a common denominator. So I'm going to have to multiply by a sine over sine, theta. And for our second term, multiply it by a cosine theta over cosine theta. All right, let's rewrite what we have. So I have sine theta times sine theta. So I have sine squared theta over sine theta times cosine theta plus cosine times cosine gives us cosine squared theta. And the bottom I have sine theta times cosine theta. Now that I have the same denominator, I can add my numerator so that I have sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta all over sine theta times cosine theta. My numerator, whenever you see squares, think Pythagorean identity. And if I take a look, sine squared plus cosine, we have that here, right? But different order, addition doesn't have an order. So I know that gives us one. So that I have one over sine theta times cosine theta. Let's take a look at B. I can think of this to have over one. And if I do, in order to create a common denominator, I just need to multiply by sine over sine. All right, so far we have cosine squared theta over sine theta minus sine squared theta over sine theta. All right, let's subtract. So I have cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta all over sine of theta. I see squares. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first rule. This time I have a minus. Hmm. If I want to use sine and cosine together, they equal one. But maybe I can simplify it. Maybe I, instead of cosine, I replace it with one minus sine squared theta. Let's go ahead and do that. Instead of cosine, I'm going to write one minus sine squared theta. See if that makes it any simpler. All right, well, if I take these two and you add the opposite, we're left with one minus two sine squared theta. That didn't really help, sine theta. So I think our answer was this guy here. Let's take a look at our answer for you to try it too. Yep, that's all I wanted. Can I be simplifying you further at this time? We'll learn tricks in the future. And I think that's my problem here. I keep trying to keep going ahead. Example four, treat cosine and sine like variables. Think cosine of x does x, sine is y. How would you treat those variables? So for example four, being asked to multiply and simplify. So we have sine theta times cosine theta minus two. So we're being asked to just multiply and simplify if possible. All right, so let's go ahead and distribute. Sine times cosine gives us sine times cosine. And sine times negative two gives us negative two sine theta. All right, that's all I wanted us to do. Let's take a look at example B. Now multiplying a binomial by a binomial. So I have to FOIL, meaning I have to multiply two cosine theta times cosine theta. So cosine times cosine gives us cosine squared, so I have two cosine squared. Two cosine theta times four. Two times four is eight, so I have eight cosine theta. Negative three times cosine theta. Negative three cosine theta. And negative three 
times 4, you get negative 12. All right, can I combine any like terms? Yeah. I can combine the cosines. So I have 8 minus 3, we have 5 cosine theta. And that's how you can treat these variables. So let's go ahead and do the u try your 3. Multiply and simplify. Hint. In expression B, it might be helpful to first write it as cosine theta minus plus 1, cosine theta plus 1. Okay, so let's go ahead and multiply. Sine times cosecant. I have sine theta times cosecant theta. And then I have sine theta times sine theta. For the negative, I have sine theta times sine theta. All right. I can each should be multiplied by each other, so I can write it as a square. So my final answer would be sine theta cosecant theta minus sine squared theta. Now for B, it's giving us a hint to write it as two terms. I'm sorry, as two binomials and multiply. So I have cosine theta plus 1 times cosine theta plus 1. All right, let's go ahead and multiply. Cosine times cosine gives us cosine squared theta. Cosine times 1 gives us 1 cosine theta. Um, 1 times cosine is another 1 cosine theta. And lastly, 1 times 1 gives us a plus 1. So our answer is cosine squared theta. And then these two are the same term. 1 cosine theta plus 1 cosine theta, they're like terms because they have a cosine theta. Think of what would be x plus x. Think of what would be x plus x. Wouldn't that give us 2x? Well, same idea. Think of cosine theta as your x. So that would give us 2x or 2 cosine theta plus I still have a 1 left over. So this would be my expanded binomial. Proving or verifying identities. So proving and verifying identities is just like simplifying, but you're going to have two arguments. Something is going to equal something else. An identity is set up to look like an equation. However, when we are attempting to prove or verify an identity, uh, we cannot assume the left and right sides are equivalent for all values theta. In other words, we don't yet know the equation is actually an identity. We might say that an equation is a supposed identity, but we're not trying to solve the equation, so we cannot use rules of equations such as adding the same term to each side of, of the equal sign. This is the big bugger. Cannot use rules of equations such as adding to both sides, subtracting to both sides, dividing, multiplying to both sides. There's no both sides. Think of them as two separate arguments. Instead, we must manipulate only one side of the supposed identity to make it identical to the other side. Once that task is complete, the identity has been proven or verified. Note, an identity, once an identity is proven, we can write an alternative identity using the rules of equations. For example, we know that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. We, can't, we can solve for cosine squared so that we have cosine squared equals 1 minus cosine. So let's say we can manipulate identities if we, if, we have, if we have them. So we have this one, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. 
But let's say I only want to work with the sine squared because that's what my argument has. So I can go ahead and move the cosine squared. So minus cosine squared theta, minus cosine squared theta, so that I have this identity. We can only do this with identities because they have been proven to be true. Example five. Oh, let's read this little asterisk. In this textbook, to prove an identity and to verify an identity mean the same thing. So the words prove, proven, or proof, and verify, verified are used interchangeably. Example five. For each, prove the equation is an identity by transforming the left side only to be equivalent to the right side. So we're going to take the techniques we learned before. One of the techniques was change everything to sine and cosine. That's the best advice there is, aside from trying it. I know this can be intimidating at first, so you have to just give it a try, see if it gives you the answer you want. All right, it's time to work with the left-hand side first. I want to show that this can be secant. Okay, well, let's rewrite it. One over cosecant is sine, tangent is sine over cosine, my sine's divide to make one. I'm left with one over cosine, and cosine is the same as secant. Now I have to write it as secant is equal to secant. And you can write QED. You can also draw a square or a square that's filled in. That's a math shorthand for a proof has been proven, or you're done with that proof. It's been proven. Note, the line on the right side indicates that we don't write on the right side expression at each step. Instead, you write it again only at the end of the proof. For example, B, it's telling us to work on the left side. So that's what we're going to do. We have tangent and secant. Tangent is sine over cosine divided by secant, and secant is 1 over cosine. All right, we can change it as a flip fraction. So sine theta over cosine theta times cosine theta over one. Our cosines cancel, we're left with just sine. So sine is equal to sine. So we finish our proof. You have to write at the end the equality, that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Some proofs are more involved and require using a variety of identities, including various forms of the Pythagorean identity. Example six, verify the equation is an identity by transforming the left side only to be the equivalent to the right side. All right. <coughs> so here we want to work with the left side only. A good starting point is change everything to cosine and sine. All right, cosecant is one over sine. Tangent is sine over cosine, and cosine, well, that stays itself, cosine. All right, again, we see sine over sine, did the divide to make one, so we're left with one over cosine minus cosine over one. Let's get a common denominator. So if we look at our denominators, we see I can multiply this by cosine over cosine to get that common denominator. So we're left with one minus one over cosine theta minus cosine squared theta over cosine. I combine my numerator, so I have one minus cosine squared theta. Whenever you see a square, take a look back at your Pythagorean identities. And we see, well, we have, we have sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. I want one minus cosine, so we can move the cosine to the other side. We're left with sine squared equals one minus cosine squared of your argument. So we have that this is equal to, what is it equal to? It's equal to sine. So I can replace all of this with sine squared. So we have sine squared theta over cosine theta, 
And we have proof that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. So you must write it as equal to, the same thing. Note, it is common, though not required, to write QED at the end of a proof. It stands for the Latin phrase quad era demonstratum. Loosely translate, it says that which, that which was to be demonstrated. It means you proved what you meant to prove. You don't have to write it. If you just box the two sides equal to each other, you can do that. Or again, you can just draw a little box and shade it in. That also means that you, you're done with your proof. All right, that's it for this section. I'll go ahead and post homework for the sections we covered so far. Um, these sections 4.8 and 5.1 will not be due on Tuesday, on this Monday, I believe. That's my due dates, right? Yeah. Which is the due date of your exam. So all chapter three homework, along with all chapter four homework, minus 4.8, is all due on Monday, April 20th. Now it has a cutoff time at midnight. So you have all day before that to get it done. Your test is also due um, on Monday, end of day. So by midnight. It doesn't mean start at midnight. It closes off by midnight. So I would say latest started by, started by um, say 9.30. So you give yourself time. It is timed. Test two will be made up of two parts. One part is multiple choice, and I'll give you one hour to complete. And then part two is open response. Again, I'll give you one hour to complete. And this part right here, the part two is going to be graphing. You're going to have to upload your uh, file for graphing. So that's why I asked that you make it a point to turn in your homework that was supposed to be uploaded. So you have practice uploading documents and you don't email me letting me know it didn't work out for you because you should have tried it by then. Um, on part two, I'm going to attach an image that looks like your Bob Pryor scratch sheet that he has for you. So if you click on my name, um, under chapter three, there's resources. And it gives us a graph template. I'm going to upload something like this so that you have it for your graphs. A portion of it will be uh, a shifted one and also an original one. We will have a template so you'll have to fill out for each one of your graphs. There will be, I'm not sure if I made it three or four graphs, but I for sure make you graph uh, a sine cosine, a sine cosine with a shift. And I'm not sure if I included one with a cosecant secant and one with a tangent cotangent, or if I just made it both of those. Now, I did make a bank, a test bank, so there is no such test that will be alike. Everyone will get a different version of a test. So if you try cheating, you be careful because <coughs> there's a very big chance to get very different questions. So the answer will be randomized. The question will be randomized. It'll all be different. And again, I'll, I'll post a document so you see what that page is going to look like in case you want to print it beforehand. But on the exam itself, I do also give you a link to that PDF to print it. If you're unable to print, if you don't have access to a printer, that's okay. Just write out a piece of paper with those same guidelines. The reason I give you or I'm asking you to work with that sheet of paper is because I don't want you to... I'm trying to make it as neat as possible for me to grade. And if I don't give you some sort of structure, it's going to give me some mess and make me figure out 
by way around it. So I'll, that's why that template is there. So that we all have something that looks sort of the same, or I can know what to look for. So again, um, I'll offer office hours on Monday. I'll offer half an hour because no one went last time and I just had my iPad on for an hour. So I'll offer, offer, offer office hours from 7 to 7.30 on Monday in case we have some last minute questions. All right. So if there aren't any questions, I guess that's it for today. I have one. Yeah. Uh, the review, are we uploading that just like the section three homework? A review? Mm, yeah, I'll make the review extra credit like before. I'll post a link for you to upload a review for extra credit. So your yeah. review I is see. on your, sure. yeah, your review, oh. Let me share my screen. Um, your review is on your homepage. Your review is on your homepage of your canvas. You click to your home canvas, your current module. Week nine. And I did post a link. And I said, if you complete the review, um, you can earn three points extra credit, and it has a little PDF link for it, so you can go ahead and try it. Okay. And your test is pretty much the same. It's the same idea as those. And it even has those graphing problems for you to try. Now, if you like to, you can see the answer to these. You go to that Bob Pryor website. Um, so let me go back to the main part. Um, it has pretests and answers. It's a chapter four pretest. That would, uh, chapter three and chapter four content is just not worded right. And it shows the answers that it has for those problems. There's no way to, uh, professor, there's no way to get the work in case like we could see a specific spot where we messed up on the work, like to check our, our work. You have the graphing done oh okay yeah totally. okay yeah yeah that was that, I, I thought it was just the answer but yeah i see that now okay thank you um, no problem and he has more of what to do for each one the the first ones the ones that are just a b c d those are just knowing how to use your number your unit circle right so looking at unit circle what sign of 150 you look at unit circle you find 150 and you have coordinate points Okay, you know sine is a y, so sine of 150 would be one half. And working with those points that are within 360 and those points that are outside of 360. So if they're outside of 360, like 295 there, you would make it a point to um, change it between zero and 360, so it's easier to work with. So for, for E, tangent of 495, you would have to subtract 360 and if you do 495 minus 360, you get 135. Tangent of 135. Okay, I can do that one. That's within my unit circle. So it's just knowing how to do that um, work between those two types of measurements. Two is radians. Um, and then from there, I feel like it's pretty straightforward, just knowing how to use your unit circle. And that would be your multiple. Just to make sure, yeah. you, wanted, you wanted us to print those graphing papers? Um, you're going to have to for your test. If for some reason you don't have access to a printer, which is fine, make it a point to write it and make it look like as much like those papers as possible. So they look something like what you see on the screen. Oh, all right. Where it has a space for the amplitude, reflected frequency. I know... Uh, Maybe you don't have paper, or you don't have ink, or you don't have printer, whatever. Just make it look as much like that as possible, so it's easier for my eyes to grade it. Can we upload it into an editing program and just draw on it digitally? 
Uh, I would rather see your handwritten work. Gotcha. All right. So if there aren't any more questions, I'll go ahead and end today's lecture. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thank you so much for participating in our lecture today. I know we, we went for a, a longer time than usual. Thank you for your patience. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.